Uh, this session is about uh, VMware environments and, and how we use Power CLI to create a DSC resource module. So, how many of you here are actually using or used Power CLI in the past? Okay, so for those of you who don't, you can stay, but there will be a lot probably that you want to learn later on. On that note, there is at 3 o'clock in the afternoon a side session by Jake and Kyle on Power CLI where they will give you a bit of info and, and, and request your feedback. So if you have the time, definitely attend that one at 3 o'clock, uh, one of the side sessions. Now, what are we going to do today or during this session? I'm going to show you where it came from, this uh, vSphere DSC module. That's the, way, uh, the name I gave to it. The way it is con uh, the concept behind it, how it is done, because vSphere is normally a, a rather closed environment where you can't just go around and install your own software on hypervisors and, and vCenters, especially if they are vCSA, the appliance type of, of the vCenter. I had to make some choices at, uh, during the design of this module, so I will highlight those as well. There were some issues, like always, uh, that's what I will explain. Some of these are solved in the meantime, others are still open, so I'll briefly show you where they are. Then I'll, I'll give you a high-level overview of the module, how I conceived it, how, how it is organized. It's quite straightforward, and then we go into the module and see how all the resources are set up. So we have the classical uh, test uh, set, get and set uh, functions, but it goes way further because we have to actually at some point interact with the vSphere environment. And then finally, uh, this thing is of course not finished. Uh, it's uh, one step in a long uh, series of steps. So I'll give you some ideas or some topics that I want to expand uh, upon uh, later on with this module. Okay, uh, a bit about me, uh, Luke Dakins, as you probably know, you saw it on, 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 the, on the agenda probably. I'm from Belgium, the Flemish part, that means the upper uh, northern part where the beer is better than in the southern part, of course, but <laughs> you all knew that. And then I've been to, into virtualization since quite some time, and I was lucky enough in, in around 2007 to be able to enter the at that time, it was called the VI Toolkit, I think, what later became the Power CLI uh, snap-ins, and nowadays it's all modules. Thank God for that. <laughs> so I was very lucky there to, to be able to, to play with this thing and see it grow over the last 10 years. So 10 years, that means there's a birthday party at VMworld uh, in the coming months, probably. I'm a bit busy in the VM VMTN community, which is the, the public community for all things VMware. So if you have a question there, feel free to ask. And it's not only me who is there, there's a lot of other people there. I have a blog where I sometimes uh, post, especially about this thing as well. You can find me on Twitter. And for those of you that are, uh, which have a visual memory, uh, just remember those three pictures at the bottom. That's more than enough than you should know uh, about me. Okay, we have been talking since quite some time about software-defined data centers, and one way, in my opinion, especially in a PowerShell environment, is to go for DSC in that case. <laughs> so DSC will allow you to package the configuration of your environment in flat text files. That's nothing more than that, what these PS1 files are all about. So that, that's where I took the decision to go for a DSC solution and, and go for a, a module that uh, implements all those different uh, vSphere resources that are available. I first uh, presented this in VMworld uh, 2015. That was a very early attempt, so uh, I got quite some feedback at that point. But I had to wait till uh, PowerShell uh, version 5 became available because there were some issues with previous versions of PowerShell 4 which made it a bit more difficult to implement what I wanted to implement, especially also since we, at that point, were still talking about snap-ins instead of uh, modules. Uh, we did two trials at the VMworld hackathons last year. Uh, I don't know if any of you participated or heard about those. Uh, we tried to uh, implement an extra, a new DSC resource class uh, in the two or th three hours we had allotted. And I can assure you, three hours is not enough to do a DSC resource class. You need a bit more. And uh, finally, uh, they uh, delivered, uh, uh, they, VMware, uh, published uh, PowerCLI 6.5 uh, Release 1, which is modules only. 
here again. So that uh, took me some steps along uh, in the development of my module and I avoided some of the problems I encountered until then. Now the concept. V uh, VMware vSphere has a very interesting API. Uh, at the moment it's still SDK. My good friend Alan is working at another solution which is probably somewhere in the near future. But since we are still uh, stuck with that SOAP, there are two types of vSphere servers. And what the beautiful thing is, the API can be used for both of them. So if you are connecting directly to an hypervisor, which is for VMware, the ESXi, or the vCenter, which can be running or on a Windows box, or can be uh, a, an appliance, you can still use the same API. So that, that's a big advantage. So you can create the resources for whatever two of those environments. Do you want to configure a standalone hypervisor? Or do you want to co uh, configure through the vCenter a complete vSphere environment? So both of the, uh, the resources can work for both of these types of environments. Now, most of you will probably be working with a, a vCenter-based environment. But it is possible to do the standalone uh, hypervisors as well. Uh, what was the basic problem? So the hypervisor, it became more and more close. They made it smaller and smaller, yes, for that. Uh, it is rather protected, so you normally don't install stuff on there. Uh, same goes for the vCenter when it's a vCSA, that's an appliance. You're not supposed to put stuff in there, unless you're called William Lamb, but that's something else. So what you can do is install the LCM agent at any of those two uh, target platforms. Uh, my solution, what I, I came up with, is we install a small uh, Windows box. At the moment, it's still a Windows box. I'm considering moving that also to an appliance with Power, uh, PowerShell Core and PowerCLI Core. I could be going that path quite soon. So what I do there on this current Windows box, I have uh, PowerCLI, PowerShell installed, and that's where my LCM agent is running. So all the configurations that I push to the vSphere environment are in fact pushed to the LCM agent on this, what I call here the vEngine. That's the one that actually will contact your vSphere environment and do the actual changes in your environment. That's the, the high level design concept, whatever you want to call it, uh, for the module in this case. So this again summarizes uh, some of the choices I made. So you already saw that I went for a, for a Windows box for the LCM agent. What I also did is, uh, I've been reading in a lot of books, and there's the book of uh, Don about the DSC book. Uh, they always tell you that you should run with certificates and all signed, but everybody mentions it, but I hardly saw any examples. So I decided in this version for the module, it's more the tools around the module to go for a fully signed environment, so I'm running actually, I know it's suicide, but I'm running actually on this vService or vEngine with uh, execution policy all signed. And I stumbled on a few things, but I, I was able to solve it. Now the other choice I made, and I know there are people who don't really like classes yet, I, I decided to go for classes. And there were a couple of reasons I decided to do that. One of them is inheritance. So I could actually uh, start with very basic objects, and you will see it later on in the code, a base object which contains the properties that are common to all the objects I have in my vSphere environment, and built on that through inheritance. So not only the properties, but the methods could be inherited all through that chain of inheritance of, of my classes. And secondly, and that was a more aesthetic uh, decision, I don't want those MOV files in my module folder. So with classes, you, don't, you avoid that stuff. So that's, that's, and apparently, and I, it seems to be so, they are a bit faster than, than going through MOV files. So classes. Sorry, are you recording? I, just to sure. yeah. I think the red light is flashing, so that yeah, should yeah, be okay, no? Sorry, sorry. No, 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 well, good, that. And uh, so to avoid the MOV files. Now, there's another thing. You can, for those of you who know PowerCLI, you have the standard commandlets, and they are perfectly okay. They are great for your daily work. But some points, you need to go for speed. So what I did is all my resources at the moment are, the, power, the, the vSphere parts are written directly addressing the APIs. And that was one of the smart decisions of PowerCLI from day one. They had the get view commandlet, where you could access the complete API SDK. 
Later on, they added the extension data on their .NET objects, and through that one, you can even access all the properties and, and methods as well from the vSphere SDK. But that doesn't mean that you can't use PowerCLI to develop these resources. So in fact, what I'm doing is I'm doing my prototyping with standard, regular PowerCLI commandlets. When I get, once I get that working, I just convert the same code. The concept is proven because that's my prototype. I convert that to API methods and properties to make it a bit faster. Uh, on this last remark that you see on this slide, the, the policy I like command is why are they a bit slower? Uh, they tend to become faster and faster, by the way. Why are they a bit slower? Because they follow this 80-20% this rule. They try to cover 80% of your requirements for a normal environment. For the 20% that is not available, for example, not all the methods that are available in the API SDK are available directly through a, a commandlet. You have to go via this get few extension data uh, operation. But in this case, that's not really uh, important. Now, some of the things, uh, I had some problems in, in, during my, my uh, writing of this module. Uh, the PS snaps in, like I already told, they fixed that one. They, they converted in 6.5 R1 to complete module environment. And there was no autoloader auto -load available. So now this is quite easily done. You just need to add this folder where you install or where they install uh, PowerCLI uh, to your uh, module, uh, PS module path. And then the autoload will work without an issue. Uh, what is still there? Okay, the certificates that I solved as well as we will see later on during the presentation. The only stumbling block that I have now, because I wanted ultimately all my code to live in those classes I'm using, but the problem was that some of the modules, and especially the PowerCLI module, he will load those. And in 5.1 of PowerShell, they added this using module statement, which is great for that. But if your module has required assemblies, meaning DLLs it should load, that is not done when you're using the US, uh, using module. So the effect there is that if I try to use it all in one class environment with the using module, some of the internal types, like all the things that start with uh, vmware.vim, they will not be found because tho those are only known at the moment when your DLL is loaded. So at the moment, I'm still struggling with that one, but that will probably come uh, at some point as well. This just goes to show that uh, this complete module here, it's, it's a progress, but I progressed the module along with, with and the PowerShell progress and the PowerCLI progress. Uh, it will never be finished and you can always make it better and better. Now, the biggest pitfall is that uh, a vSphere environment is, is quite complex. Not to the number of objects, but to, to the way the connections are made. And I can understand why this is. vSphere, at the moment they're at version 6.5 was written over a period of time. So there is some inheritance. Uh, there is some stuff. They're not never rewriting the complete stuff from scratch every time. That is clear. Nobody is doing that, probably. So there are some strange phenomena uh, that you uh, see if you look at it. What I try to do here is uh, I took the major objects as you can find them in, in a vSphere environment. And I try to show in a graph from where they can originate. So for example, if you look at the top there, there is a host that represents a hypervisor. This hypervisor is located or can be located in a host folder. There are others laid more about that. Now, the host could also be part of a cluster. All seems logical. But if we now look at the right side of the diagram here, there we have this VSS, which stands for the oldest, the standard virtual switch. That one is, for example, has no link to your network folder that is only known on your hypervisor because that was there from day one, that virtual switch. So for those, you can't really use the same logic. And that was my biggest problem. Some of these connections in there in that schema are not logic. So there's a lot of if then else's and switches in my code where I will have to distinguish between those different uh, possibilities of objects, how they are related and interlinked to each other. So this was, in fact, for the coding, uh, one of the biggest stumbling blocks. Now, I mentioned the class, why I took classes uh, early on. Uh, I'm going step aside so you can all see this. Uh, what I did is I started with uh, 
a, a base class, which I called VMW base. And in there are a number of uh, properties. Uh, it's the standard. I suppose all of you know how you define uh, properties in a DSC class. If not, there are some other sessions that explain this. The ones that I put in the yellow box there, these are the key values. So my base already defines, and that is common to all my objects in the module. They have a, a name and a path. The path in this case, if you remember the previous diagram, is the host folder, not any of the three others. Now, if we do inheritance, for example, we are now defining a class for uh, this standard switch port group. And now we are uh, over here on the right side bottom there. That one adds some extra properties. So it takes the one from the base class we have over there. The inheritance is marked by the dot dot uh, VMW base. Those properties, plus it adds some uh, new ones. First of all, the name of the switch, which is logical. Also, the, the name of the switch on which it is located, which is logical. And then the name of the VLAN ID. If that's an optional one, that's uh, why it's not marked uh, mandatory. And then at the bottom, we see that it has a new key value. So in fact, you can have multiple key properties in a class. I think I heard this morning something else, but you can have multiple property keys. So that one will now, if we look, if we remember the network folder, that will indicate the path starting from this uh, network folder. So there are two paths that we define on a virtual switch. That's why I like this uh, class inheritance. This is much clearer than doing this in your standard uh, PowerShell code with the standard uh, resource modules. And we go. This goes further on these uh, folders I mentioned earlier. So this is another thing that I uh, particularly like uh, in, in the later one. You can have four types of folders, as I mentioned earlier, and as we saw in the diagram. They can even have the same name. So you can have a, f a folder with the name, same name, but it could be one in the host folder, in the network data store, or the virtual machine slash template folder. So we have to make sure, and that's what we did with the switch, but we can do this uh, with the folder as well, as I show over there. Folder, again, inherits from the base class, remember. But now, the folder here contains an extra property where I indicate the type. So if you want to create a folder in your vSphere environment, you give the standard values name path, but you have to indicate what type of folder this is. This sounds simple, but this only works once you're past the first data center. If you define a folder higher up, it's again a special case. But like I said, there's a lot of, of exceptions and, and, and uh, if then else's in the code that you need to do. Now, I'm not sure if that is quite visible from the back. It's a screenshot, so I can't really enlarge, I can enlarge it, in fact. But one of the basic functions in, in my module is locating a specific node. Suppose you want to create a, a VM. You have to indicate where it is located. Now, you have to find that location. Now, it would be easy if you could follow, and most of the objects have that. The object has a property called parent, which is a pointer to the object directly in front of it in the hierarchy. But that's not the case for all objects due to this historic uh, legacy stuff that we drag along. So if you look here, this is the, the, the nucleus of, of my find node uh, module uh, function. I really, depending on the type of object I'm looking for, I have special cases to consider. So if you want to traverse uh, for a cluster, uh, in this case, a cluster computer resource, you also have to look at all, not only the regular children, but also on the hosts. And if you, for them, for each host, you have to look at the data stores, the VMs, the network, which are the port groups, and so on. So the location of a node and its parent is a bit more complex than just follow a chain of uh, parent properties uh, with pointers in there. So this, this is one that I worked quite a bit on because I, to get it actually finding in each case the correct uh, path was, was a bit cumbersome in the beginning. Now, how did I organize this module? Uh, it's quite simple. Uh, there's a lot of, of overhead uh, at the top, the testing and the tools, but the, the three important ones are, are these at the bottom here. So it's a module, there's a manifest, and then because of the problem I mentioned earlier with those uh, DLLs, the types and the required assemblies, all the 
functions that actually use PowerCLI code, they are located in what I call a helper file. Now, this helper file uh, is dot source. We'll come to that later. So that explains why we can get all the required assemblies in at that point. Now, once we go into a specific resource, I, I gave the example of, of the folder here, and I work a lot with regions. So if you have long code, I strongly suggest to use regions and be able to collapse it. It's not 100% in the Visual Stored Code Editor. In the ISE it works 100%. Here you have to have aligned uh, regions, otherwise it doesn't collapse like it should. It's not the PowerShell plugin that has the problem, it's the Visual Code itself that has the problem with collapsing. At least that's what David tells me. So there is always the same layout. I have the properties, that's some of the class properties that we saw earlier. There's another region with the standard functionality, set, test, and get, the three ones that you always need for a DSC resource. And that's the ones that contain the actual logic. And at the bottom, you have functions that are not yet using PowerCLI, but which have a bit more knowledge of your vSphere environment. We'll zoom in on those later on so you know what I mean. It's a bit hard to explain in this case. OK, why we split the thing I already explained uh, several times is because of the, the types there. So what we do is, and like I explained, we put all the PowerCLI code in a separate helper file, and that one we dot source. So if we go back to the first uh, PSM1 file, in there, in each of the main functions, in this case it's a set function, we do a dot source of that helper file. That way I at least get all the types available in my, my functions. This is something I hope, and this is not a PowerCLI problem, this is probably, a, this is a PowerShell issue, perhaps as designed, but I would hope that they fix this at some point and then I can put everything together in, in one class instead of using this helper file. Uh, to continue, I mentioned this, uh, these classes and the inheritance scheme already. So this is a very good example, in, at least in my opinion, of how this, this inheritance helps you in defining your classes. What you see here in, in, on the right side, ultimately we come to an NFS data store. So in vSphere you can have multiple data stores. One of the types is an NFS uh, data store. We start with the base uh, class. I already showed that before. There are a number of properties that are common for all the resource classes. Then I extend it to a data store. So there's a data store type, a data store mode, that means read, write, or read only. And there's a data store path. Remember, that's the path in your storage folder. And then you have the specific properties for, in this case, an NFS data store. So this is quite elegant, especially if you are developing code. This is quite easy. You know everything that is concerning NFS I can find in that class definition. All the stuff that is common, uh, up until the most common, I just descend down in the class inheritance tree. So if you're not convinced of classes as, as a beautiful way of writing code, I think this is a good example. This was only for the properties, but you can also do this for the methods, of course. I could have shown you on the database, uh, there are some base uh, functions defined, which you also inherit in, in derived uh, classes later on. Now, I said that we have the basic functions uh, set, test, and get. These are almost always exactly the same. So those you can just copy and paste, and they could in fact even go to the base class because they are quite simple. And what I do in there is only the logic. So if you look at the lines there, there are a number of possibilities there. You have an object. So when you do a test that is quite simple, you see, can I find the object? If you can't find the object, the one, first option is it's not there, but you don't want it there. Fine, return true. Then you have, it's not there, but I want it there. Then you have to return false, and it goes on like this. So there's only four possibilities that you can have in this kind of logic. And it tends to be always the same, except for the beginning there, where we have the, the cl test cluster state. So that, that is uh, a bit special. But for the rest, we always come down to the same result. We return a Boolean value, true or false, depending on the outcome of the tests. We did there. Now, if we want more 
uh, tests to be done. Remember, you saw the test state for the cluster in that case. It's not only a matter if a specific object is there or isn't there. The object can be there, but not exactly in the configuration that you want. For example, you can have a cluster, but HA or DRS, which are features of a VMware cluster, are not active. So at that point, you don't have to redefine the cluster object, but you have to reconfigure the cluster object, which is a bit different. So except for testing for presence, yes or no, you also have to test if the state corresponds with your desired state. And some of the vSphere objects have quite a lot of uh, properties that you should be able to test. Just think of a virtual machine. This can go from number of CPUs all the way up to uh, the type of disks or several types of disks, thin, thick, and so on. So there's a lot of testing on state of your object that you have to do at, at these uh, runs of the LCM. So what you see here, this is the one for the cluster. I defined uh, a number of properties. Uh, I check, for example, uh, if, if H, uh, all these four that you see there, HADRS, uh, power management, and if vSAN is configured, you go off into a function, and my, uh, my standard there is if I name it with a dash, so the standard uh, verb noun uh, name, that it goes off into the PowerCLI helper file. So that is the one where I'm actually going to be using PowerCLI code. Up till here, it's just plain code, nothing to do with vSphere or PowerCLI. Now we're in this helper file, and this might uh, be a bit uh, too much for if you just start looking at it. But this is actually API code. So the disadvantage of using the API directly is you need to write a lot of lines. So that's the advantage of policy like commands. They do all that stuff for you. They just have a few parameters on a commandlet. When you go directly to the API, uh, you need a bit more code. And you need a bit more knowledge about uh, what each of these properties in, a, in, a, in this object means. So if you're going to this way, uh, you better put the API SDK reference on your nightstand and you read every night a couple of pages of that book. <laughs> and it should become a bestseller uh, over time. So that is the specific power CLI code separate folder, separate file, sorry. Now, we have the module. We split that up. We have the logic code. We have the power CLI code. The next thing that we're looking at is the actual configuration. That's where we're going to specify what we want our vSphere environment to look like. And in there, I used uh, the concept that I'm uh, splitting the where and what. So you know this, everybody read that article on, on DSC where you can split where and what environment and, and, and structure. Uh, so that's what I'm doing here. So the actual data, the name of your for cluster, for example, that's something very specific that I keep in a separate file. Defining or injecting those properties into the class in the configuration file, that's rather general. And that's what I'm trying to show over here. So this is the general part. So for each of the clusters, we're going to the data config later on. You just have the for each loop, and it fills in the properties one by one. If you define two clusters, there will be two runs over this loop. If you have only one, there will be one run through this loop. In this case, it's data centers, by the way, not, not clusters. But you get the idea. So this is very abstract. This, this works for every configuration. You, this is nothing specific for your specific environment. So that file can be rather standardized. We only need to make it, make it once and just add some stuff in there when we add a new resource class. Now, if you are going to look at the actual data that we want in there, that's this part. So remember, he was uh, reading through uh, uh, an array of uh, folders in the, uh, no, he was data center, but this is an example with folders. What I do here, we have an array, and in there are two folders that are defined. Remember, uh, we have uh, a few fields that we always have to do. We have a folder name, we have a path, we have the type. That's the type of the folder that we want in this case. So this is very specific data. This is for your environment or for a new environment you're setting up. That plugs in into that other data. And what you can do is that file is a flat text file. You put that under source control. 
and there's even a, a specific uh, type for that, that's PSD1. And you can add that when you call the configuration. The configuration in this case was combo T1 in my example, configuration data. And then we just point to this file where we, where we saved uh, this specific configuration. Now, what is the advantage of doing it that way? This is a flat fi uh, text file without a lot of extra information or overhead information. You put that under source control, you can run diffs on there. You can have version control on there. So it's, it's rather straightforward to go to make that step to your software defined. This is your software defined data center, in my opinion. A big part of it, at least. This is what you do. In this case, we do it with DSC. It could be other tools that you, but this is actually the part that defines your environment. So that's why we went that part. Uh, security, I already mentioned that I unfortunately decided at some point to run with all signed, which was in the beginning not a good idea, but okay, I got out of it. Uh, simple, there are two types of certificates I uh, the defined. So in fact, I had to set up my own uh, CA authority create uh, some certificates. There's two types if you want to do this. There's one to sign your configuration files, just to make sure that the other side, the agent, the LCM who is receiving it, can be sure that it's actually your official pool. So I'm using a pool server that is sending it. And the second one is to encrypt your passwords. Because as you know, if you put uh, a password, it's in clear text in your MOF file, and that goes over the line. So if somebody intercepts that, that's quite critical, in my opinion. So what you can do is, that's the other type of certificate. If you run it, or you configure your LCM to work like that, this is the way you, how your passwords, they are encrypted in your MOF file. So no more risk that over the line somebody can intercept your passwords. Uh, I it's probably not visible to the back of the room, but this is a bit uh, the two types uh, of certificates and how you how I create the credentials. You could create those credentials outside of your configuration file, but okay, for simplicity, I did it like that. And you pass them. Uh, one you pass via the all nodes. It's some very straightforward keywords you have to use. The template and the certificate file. And remember, that's a certificate file on the other side, the receiving agent. That's the one you have to get that file there, but in fact, that's nothing more than a file resource in, in another DSC configuration file that you have to get over there. In this case, for me, that's this V engine where this one will be located. So when he gets the encrypted password, he receives them, he will decrypt them with that set file, and he knows how to read uh, this password. Okay, uh, the helper files. There's a number of, I already mentioned one. Uh, the one to find a node from a specific part. So I have a number of, of uh, functions in the helper file that are quite common, which are practically used by each resource. The first one uh, we got rid of, because that's the one where we did the import module. We don't need that anymore. So it's an empty shell at the moment, but I leave it there due to backward compatibility with some of my scripts. The next one is a connect to the uh, vCenter uh, server. What it does is the first call, it will actually use the password user account that we encrypted. And then from that first connection, it keeps the session ID in the class object. So that's a special property in there. So we don't have to do that connect each time. It's a small thing, but it's, it's handy to you. The rest is uh, more specific on nodes and folders, how to find the node. But there are a few important ones here. Is like I said, you can only have, for example, a, a, a standard switch port group on a switch, on a standard switch. That function there, uh, test is parent correct. That's actually going to test if you request a new object, if the parent is actually of the correct type. So that's also a lot of, of if then else's and switches in there to provide that logic. Uh, the rest is, is quite straight. How are we doing on time, by the way? Okay, reasonable. And strange as it may sound, because it's normally only text, I do have something to show you. To sh because I know uh, food fatigue will start to set in at this time of the day. So there are some moving pictures here at this point. 
So there's not a lot to be seen, in fact, on the DSC uh, configuration that is running on the, oh shit, I have to, <laughs> it doesn't switch automatically. Uh, why is that? <coughs> Just a minute. Why don't I get that? Hmm. <sighs> This is strange. Sorry about that. Let me close this first. That's better. Okay, I'll go back to the beginning. It doesn't take very long. It's it's just a sample run. It will also show you that it's it's quite fast, this configuration. So the top line, if you can still see it, uh, it's just calling uh, one of those configuration files, the combo. And what you see here is a lot of verbos. I always run my stuff with verbos while I'm, I'm doing that. Verbos is your friend if you're doing uh, DSC resources. So there's a lot of in, uh, stuff in there uh, uh, on the right side, which is mostly for debugging purposes, but keep it in and uh, it's useful. On the right side, I show part of the vSphere web client. Now, you see my mouse moving from time of, uh, to time there to open some of these because, unfortunately, it doesn't refresh automatically. So I sometimes have to click on one of the objects. Now, while we see the resources passing through here, so he's, doing, uh, he's adding hosts in there, he's adding data stores in there. He already did the data center. That's what we finally see. So there's a folder. In the folder, we have a cluster. So. There are some VMs, they were already running on one of those hypervisors, so that's not a big deal. And as you can see here, in 60 seconds, uh, our configuration completed. That's in my lab, which is not extraordinary equipment. The data store we defined even went to a specific folder in there. That's the DS9. We defined uh, a switch, which also went to its own folder, PG1. So all this stuff here was done in 60 seconds, uh, no hands. And what is more interesting is if we now change something uh, in there, if we delete one of those folders or we delete the switch, it will just come back after the next run of the LCM agent. Uh, let me just position back on where we were. Okay, so... You just saw we started from a, an empty VCSA in this case, and we added uh, quite a bit of resources on there. Now, what it's not doing, and I'm not hiding this, the hypervisors were already there, they were uh, running. But for that stuff, you have things like auto-deploy and so on, and there are other possibilities to deploy. One of the things I'm, I'm looking at is how I can deploy this initial VCSA as well in, in an attended uh, fashion. William Lem has a good post on that, so I'm trying to get that into my module as, as one of the resources. Uh, like I said, there's a few future uh, subjects I'm trying to attack. At the moment, I have quite simple testing, for example. I have some simple pester testing, unit testing, which does nothing more than checking if the manifest contains all the resources that are used. So very straightforward stuff. If the class methods are returning the correct types, but I want to go further. There's also things like, like uh, functional testing. And for that, of course, you have to make a decision at some point. A lot of this stuff, like we just saw in the, in the small uh, video, creates stuff in, in your environment. So in fact, what you need is a green field or, or a test environment where, for your functional tests at least. So I'm going to expand on those, uh, seeing if I have a config file with a cluster in there, if it actually is creating a cluster. I can test in a unit test if it's returning a cluster class, but that's, it's one step further. And once the cluster is there, I want to test if all the settings are correct. Is HA active? Is DRS active? So that testing can go quite a bit further than what I have at the moment. Uh, like I said in there, uh, if there are other ideas, so for, I'm at the moment thinking of a greenfield uh, test environment, a cloud-based thing, whatever, sandbox. If there are anybody with, with other ideas on that, uh, please do. What I'm also trying to tackle, and you saw the beginning of that in the small demo, in the past I used Vagrant to set up my test environment in my lab. 
uh, which is a bit stupid because with DSC I can now actually do the same thing than that Vagrant is doing, quite simple. So I'm switching that to DSC, but that was a bit of a chicken and the egg thing. I couldn't use it until I had sufficient classes, the resource classes, to do all that stuff. And then the last one that is, is a quite uh, important one, and Microsoft, more specifically Jeffrey Snow, were always mentioned that it, DSC is a, is a tool, is a framework. It's not a complete management environment, so there needs to be some tools on top of your DSC uh, setup. So this DSC resource class I'm currently working on will get some accompanying uh, scripts, tools. My next session tomorrow, I will show one of the tools, which is in fact reverse engineering. You start from an existing vSphere environment, and that one generates configuration files to recreate that environment. So that's, the re that's one of the tools that I mean DSC is nothing but a framework. You need to put your functionality on top of that. So uh, I'll be working on, on that as well. And every contribution is welcome there, of course. So that's why I did this one here. At the moment, my complete repository is on Bitbucket private repository. You won't be able to see it. But uh, I'm, after when I'm back home from this thing, I will uh, push it to GitHub. So uh, the newer version, there is already a version there, but that's an old one from last year. So there will be a newer version available. What I also plan to do is because I heard from a lot of people that it's quite complex, that they are a bit daunted to start writing or contributing. I will try to create a blog post, kind of a cookbook thing. How do you add your own DCSC resource class? Like you saw, there's a lot of copy and paste in there. The layout is a bit template-like. You only have to inject that power CLI slash vSphere specific part in the end. All the rest is rather straightforward. And like I said, you can do your prototyping in PowerCLI. No reason or no, no justification to start using APIs from day one. If you just want to create a resource, go for the PowerCLI command. It's more than enough to start with. So I hope that that will gain some traction and there's a bit more involvement from the community uh, in the end. Okay, this repeats a bit uh, that template structure that I already mentioned. Uh, yeah, I think I showed mo most of those uh, prototyping. Okay, you had it. Once you go in, in production, then you can consider, uh, do I actually need to convert this to API methods? Is the speed actually, is it that slow that it justifies putting the effort for API conversion in there? Sometimes it just isn't. Eh? Some of that's of these uh, commanders are nowadays so fast that you don't need to go to API methods anymore. That's, in fact, uh, a bit my part now. Is there any question or any? Yes, please. Speaking of going to API, is there anything like Tonics at the time that would that still? Luckily, the PowerCLI PM is sitting here on the front row, and he will be able to answer that. Jason, oh, Jake, sorry. That's a good way, but there's a small issue in 6.5. I don't think that the current Onyx web client works. So for 6.5, you will have to wait a bit, I suppose. Power CLI 6.0. That answers your, and like I said, there's a three o'clock, there's a side session by these two guys. So that's the ideal place to raise your question there, I suppose. Any other questions? If there are questions, but you're afraid to speak in public, I'll be around here. Uh, just hit me uh, up and uh, I'll, I'll be happy to answer your questions. And if you want to look at the code, if we have internet connection, which is a rare commodity nowadays, I can show you some of the stuff if you want to go deeper in there. No more questions, then I thank you for attending. You. Oh, shit. Is it supposed